Hi, I'm Margot Lapierre, and I will be your host tonight. Welcome to the launch of Changing the Face of Canadian Literature, a diverse Canadian anthology. This anthology, edited by Dane Swan, is home to fiction, nonfiction, and poetry by phenomenally talented and community-minded authors, including Norma Dunning, Adam Pottle, Pamela Mordecai, Senna Yi, Kai Kello, Charlie Petch, Doretta Lowe, Jesus Maya, Sheena Kamal, Mary Pinkowski, Sarah Tilly, Jamal Jackson Rogers, Ayelet Tabari, Doyali Islam, Leslie Shimo Takahara, Charles C. Smith, Daniele Denorio, Alessandra Nakavaro, Jael Richardson, Dwayne Morgan, Danila Botha, Michael Frazier, Jenny Lee Austria, Ian Kateku, Lisa Dean, Nasra, Tanya Evanson, Ashley Hind, Pratap Reddy, and Clara Duplessis. Thank you so much for being here. Tonight, we'll be enjoying readings by 13 of the anthology's contributors, and we'll be sharing excerpts from Guernica Editions publisher Michael Mirola's six-fold interview series with Dane Swan, Ayelet Sabari, Leslie Shimotakahara, and Denny Labotha. Let's get more comfortable here. You can all get comfortable at home too. This first interview is with Michael Mirola and Ayelet Sabari. And if you would like to see other parts of the interviews, you can find them on Guernica Editions YouTube page. Michael Mirola is an award-winning novelist, short story writer, playwright, and poet. Michael describes his fiction as a mix of magic realism, surrealism, speculative fiction, and metafiction. Michael Mirola's latest literary awards are the 2020 Reader Views Award and Hamilton Literary Award for his novella, The Last News Bender, with Quattro Books in 2019, and the 2016 Bersani Literary Prize for his short story collection, Lessons in Relationship Dyads with Red Hen Press in 2015. In 2010, with business partner Connie McParland, Michael took over the reins at Guernica Editions, one of Canada's thriving and independent presses. Born in Italy and raised in Montreal, Michael now makes his home in Hamilton, Ontario. Ayelet Sabari was born in Israel to a large family of Yemeni descent. Her first book, The Best Place on Earth, won the Sammy Rohrer Prize for Jewish Literature and was a New York Times book review editor's choice. Her memoir, The Art of Leaving, published by HarperCollins, was published in February 2019. Please welcome Michael and Ayelet. <laughs> you contributed a piece to the changing uh, the face of Canadian literature anthology, yeah. uh, Green, I think it was, right? right. Uh, any specific reason why you would submit material to an anthology with a title of this, uh, like this? I, I was really excited about uh, the idea of this anthology. I liked, uh, I like to see, you know, I, I always like to see diversity in, in publishing and in specifically in um, Canadian literature uh, and I love to see the change that has been taking place over the past decade or so since I started uh, publishing and sending things out and um, it, it becomes you know it's still there's still a lot to be desired but it's become it, it's becoming easier I think for writers to tell stories in a different way that was that was very astute what Dane said there it's not just, you know, it's also, it's also about the mode of telling a story, uh, which often is related, I, I find, to, to where a person is from or their background or their identity. You know, uh, I don't know if uh, Italian writers uh, experience that as well, but, you know, I've been told before that my writing was too much. You know what I mean? I feel like that relates to being too much, <laughs> you know, much. And, okay. and like a mentality, right? Like, right. or a little too dramatic or something. So it, it's, it's, it's all related. Uh, our identity is very much uh, our, our way of writing and our identity are, are entwined. Um, so yeah, I, I just love to, to, you know, to be able to, uh, to be a part of it, you know, mm -hmm. and it just got a, a start review 
at the Quill and Choir, the latest issue. I was very, very pleased to see that. Fantastic. Um, yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I mean, you know, as I guess you've just given, I was going to ask the next question was going to be, do you have an opinion on, on the state of, of Canadian literature at, at the mm -hmm. present time? And, and you said that things have changed over the past 10 years that since you started. Uh, you know. they, they have, absolutely. Um, even just, you know, like when I think of my MFA program, um, it was predominantly white uh, back then. Um, the same program now is no longer that way. Um, and that again affected my experience of it. I loved it and I was, I was, I got a lot from it, but I've had some tough moments at the writer's workshop, you know, where I didn't feel understood or, um, people needed me to explain a lot of things. Uh, and I think it just, readers are, I think we should need to give readers some credit, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. they're able sure. to, um, Read. I, I love reading from different cultures and from different countries. It's never been, not, not only it's never been uh, determined for me, it's also just, I, I, I'm excited about it. I, I want to read from, from other cultures and other countries. Um, and I think um, the publishing industry is understanding that now more. Our first reader tonight is Clara Duplessis. Clara Duplessis is a poet residing in Montreal. Her debut collection, Eke, was released from Palimpsest Press in spring 2018, and her chapbook, Wax Lyrical, shortlisted for the B.P. Nickel Chapbook Award, was published by Ann Struther Press in 2015. Clara is the editor for Carte Blanche and currently pursuing a PhD in English literature. Welcome, Clara. Hello, my name is Clara Duplessis. I'm extremely happy to be included in this beautiful anthology that came out in 2020. I've decided to read two poems uh, that are included in this anthology and which I haven't really had the time to read before. So it's, it's a pleasure to share these works. This one is called Essay Dwellers. They arrested the windows, so transparency became a big, gaping hole. The verbose darkness of metropolitan public gardens punished by tiny welts, leaves leave on wet sidewalks. Vowels age into words. Light conditions glorify my life. I walk into my living room and it's the Renaissance, halos traipsing around in exercise routines. Women with strange round breasts. Are they tied with string to bulge forward like mushrooms? I sit up and listen and wrap the stillness around my waist. Vanity is healthy. Women, remember, when you think you're selfish, you're still generous. I dwell in different kinds of reading, functional, pleasant, genital. It's dangerous to be dependent on walking away from your meaning. And the second poem I'm gonna read is called A uh, Milk. Strange specificity of grammar, hurtling nourishment without prefix, utilitarian innuendo, slipping between action, hand on teat, and noun, a receptacle watered down these days to 1% or 2%, normal milk, odor delirious, delicate fluid. Abnormal milk is the bud of white juice pulsing from the wound of a flower, clean cut with a poisonous shrub in a family garden, panicked adults raging against the danger of picking the white and pink petals kindly. My editor, who is now my friend, suggests that the instant of thinking of a poem insinuates the beginning of writing it, and I tend to agree. The sticky note stuck to my wall for half a year, now prompting 
a milk as a reasonable topic to write about, yellowing not from age, but by the soft chicken color of the paper. This poem is not what I expected it to be. Mostly I think of a uh, as an article, as still life lent to the table of sentences, but it's also an appendage orchestrating grander meanings. That little surrogate limb meandering into negation, atheist, approximation, aside, ashore, novelty, a new, motion, ascend, aspiration, hopes and dreams passing into the soft outward collapse of warm air from the lungs into cold surroundings, lactic breath opacity. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you, Clara. Our next reader tonight is author Charlie Petch. Charlie Petch is an award-winning playwright, musician, lighting designer, and spoken word artist. They tour internationally as a feature and also their spoken word theater show, Mel Malarkey Gets the Bums Rush and Daughter of Geppetto. They're a member of the League of Canadian Poets and have been published by Descant, The Malahat, Matrix, and more. Lyrical Miracle published Late Night Knife Fights, their first collection. Find out more at www.charliecpetch.com or on social media at Saw Poet. Welcome, Charlie. When the woodsman handed me to you, Geppetto, Back when I was just a talking log, I knew only one thing to tell my creator, my, my new father, that I was to be a real boy. And Geppetto, though you heard me, you whittled me into a wish for a daughter named Pinocchio. Father. Isn't life a funny tide? When I am washed into the belly of a shark, one so big it swallowed your whole ship, and I find you eating the raw fish that clap at your feet, and you grinned a shine of scales and greeted me, Pinocchio! I should have been full of mirth, for I had thought you dead for years, but what came out of my mouth was, no father, it's me, your son, Pinocchio. And I waited for that old rage, the one that called me sick, called me devil, called me daughter, that shouted me from our little hut. But instead you smiled as if you had to make room for six sets of teeth and said, Pinocchio? It was then I realized what living in the belly of a shark might do to a person. Father Geppetto, you suffer a softened mind, remember little, and can be convinced of anything. So this, this is our true story. Back when I slept at your feet, I used to beg the fairy to turn me into something different, something softer, like your, your blanket or a pillow, something never to be named, only held. And Father, I'm sorry. I know that after I left, you became the town's grim tale, a wearied voice that would slap the sides of houses, demanding that your daughter, Pinocchio, be returned. You should have looked for me instead. I told you my name before I left. This morning, after our bath, and I was cutting your nails, you asked me if I had written another chapter 
in the book I'm writing about our lives, The Adventures of Pinocchio, could I read it to you? Father, I read it only after you are asleep. I go out into the woods so as to not shatter the windows with the menace of birds that arrive, their beats thirsty to erase this lie of a nose that winds and curls as I tell you the story that I want you to hear. And Father, I'm sorry for how, for what ease it brings me to know that you will never remember to call me Pinocchio again in your deep vertigo. And I know I hear you ask the fairy each night to turn me into a real boy before you die. But that old wish, it means nothing to me now. This morning, you held me and said, Pinocchio, you are such a fine boy, such a good lad. Father, this is all I've ever needed, was to feel real in your eyes. Thank you, Charlie. Next up, we have author Dwayne Morgan. Affectionately known as the godfather of Canadian spoken word, Dwayne Morgan has shared his work on stages around the globe since 1993. The author of 10 titles and eight albums, Morgan has also been inducted into the Walk of Fame in his hometown of Scarborough, Ontario. Please welcome Dwayne. Good evening, my name is Dwayne Morgan. Thank you so much for your support of changing the face of Canadian literature. I'm very excited to have a few pieces in this awesome collection. I'm going to read one of those pieces as part of this virtual launch and encourage you if you don't already have it to go out there and make sure you support and get yourself a copy in light of a lot of the things that have been going on in the last year or so um, i'm going to choose to read um, colin k which is short for colin kaepernick um, the football player who um, began protesting uh, police injustice and lost his job and career as a result. In 2016, in response to injustice and police brutality, San Francisco 49ers QB Colin Kaepernick decided to take a knee, refusing to stand for the playing of the American anthem whose ideals weren't living up to the experiences of those who looked just like him. Imagine a people up in arms because a black man chooses to kneel in order to take a stand for those killed with their arms up put down like sick pets just without the dignity this they consider disrespectful to the country more so than marches for equality still happening in 2017 more so than sports teams named the braves redskins blackhawks more so than the $30 million that LeBron James makes but still comes home to find nigger spray painted on his front gate. Clearly, Colin forgot that signing a contract means stepping away from your community and pledging allegiance to the league whose owners sit like overseers watching black men make them money on their fields. This feels all too familiar, almost like deja vu. Don't worry about the others. Be happy they aren't you. Don't notice the lynchings even though they're in plain view. Do what we pay you to do. Don't worry about them. Play your position so that you won't be next. He stepped offside and spent the season on the bench. 2017. Jeez, I might as well say 2021. And he still has no team. Possibly the end of a lifelong dream simply for taking a knee to take a stand, to speak for the voiceless, from Mike Brown to Sandra Bland. This is what happens when we refuse to be quiet. This is what happens to those who disrupt and riot. This is what happens when we speak on injustice and violence in a world that would prefer us to just sit and be silent. Whether in sports, corporate America, or the spoken word, life just seems so much more comfortable when we are seen and not heard. 
Teams that would benefit from his talent see him as too much of a risk. We're pretty safe when we're handling a ball, but no one wants a black man who actually stands up for things that might affect the sale of tickets and people's enjoyment of the game. Can you imagine if he inspired other athletes to start doing the same, to use their money and celebrity to advocate for change, but instead they make him an example. His career is almost dead because even unarmed and on our knees, we still remain a threat. Thank you so much for your time. Get out there and support changing the face of Canadian literature. I'm Dwayne Morgan. Enjoy. Thank you, Dwayne. Next up, author Jenny Lee Austria. Jenny Lee Austria is a Filipina Canadian writer, youth mentor, social service worker, and the founder of Filipino Talks, a program that builds bridges between school staff and Filipino students. Originally from Sarnia, Ontario, she wandered throughout North America and Europe before finally settling in downtown Toronto, where she begrudgingly learned how to kayak. Welcome, Jenny Lee. Hi everybody, my name is Jenny Lee and I'm the author of The Kayaking Lesson. Uh, for this short story, I really wanted to push myself to write a story that was as close to my experience as possible while still being fiction. And so, just like the main character in the story, Lena, I grew up beside the Chemical Valley. <laughs> so she's from Corona, I'm from Sarnia, and moved to Toronto as a university student. And also went to a kayaking lesson. Uh, Lena is stuck in this kayaking lesson with an um, instructor named Chris and he is someone that I think a lot of people of color will recognize um, as someone who is trying to educate her about what her identity is and based on people that he's met on his one trip to the Philippines and she is trying to grapple with this while reflecting on all of the little things that um, have built up her Filipino Canadian identity since childhood. So let me read you a little bit of this uh, so you can see. So the kayaking lesson. Welcome to kayaking with Chris, the instructor called out. He was a middle-aged man with tanned arms and sun-starved legs. Came down from Marmora to try to teach some intro classes. If these go well, I can start my kayaking school, so promise you won't make my first TripAdvisor review a bad one. We laughed as he handed us our life jackets. Marilyn was a newly retired teacher. I've kayaked once or twice before, but I just needed to stop myself from watching another hour of CP24, she said, eagerly clicking her life jacket into place. Dan wore sunglasses in the back of his head and shielded his eyes with a sunburned hand. I'm a paralegal by day, but a photographer by passion, he said, holding up a clunky waterproof camera. The skyline will be beautiful at sunset, and I'm going to sell some gems to Nat Geo if I'm lucky. He wiped the foggy lens with his fat finger. I'm Lena, and I'm new to Toronto, I said. I read that this class will teach me how to paddle to the Toronto Islands on my own, and that sounds like a great break from the city. Hey, you a Filipino? Chris took off his floppy tilly hat, his piercing eyes appraising me. Well, I was born in Canada. Just got back with a buddy of mine from the beach area. Borake, he interrupted. I love the Philippines, especially the people. I'll tell you all about it. Who wants to be the first one out? The dock hand asked. My hand shot up. I clambered into the yellow tsunami kayak and was pushed out before Chris could teach me how to paddle. Lena, you're going to hit the dock. I plunge my paddle into the water and desperately pull it towards me, splashing murky lake water all over my lap. Paddle on both sides, Marilyn said, using her kayak to nudge mine towards the open harbor. Left, right, left, right, and don't stick the whole paddle in, just skim the water. I dipped the paddle in gently and pushed behind me. Left, right, left, right, I said under my breath. And to my surprise, the kayak obeyed and went forward. I closed my eyes, relieved. You praying? Chris asked, paddling past me with broad, confident strokes. Filipinos are real religious. Met a girl in Borake who said she'd prayed to meet someone like me. What a compliment, eh? Met her family and I'd never seen so many little brown folks in my life. Felt like a giant. 
You should have seen the way they treated me, like I was a god or something. Left, right, left, right, I mouthed. <laughs> Thank you so much. Next up, Pamela Mordecai. Pamela Mordecai writes poetry and fiction for children and adults. Her first collection of short stories, Pink Icing, appeared in 2006 to enthusiastic reviews. In 2015, her debut novel, Red Jacket, was shortlisted for the Roger Writers Trust Fiction Award. She and her husband, Martin, live in Kitchener, Ontario. Welcome, Pamela. Happy 2021. I had some very good news towards the end of the horrible 2020 year. Um, I heard that a collection of my poetry, uh, selected poems from all the books I've ever published from the very start, um, edited by two wonderful women, a Canadian academic, Stephanie McKenzie from Memorial University of Newfoundland, and a Jamaican academic, Carol Bailey, who works at Westfield State University in Connecticut in the US. Um, these wonderful people had worked as editors on uh, um, selection of my poetry, and they were facilitated by a third marvelous woman, Canadian woman, Terry Ann MacDonald. And so a fierce green place, new and selected poems by Pamela Mordecai will appear from a very distinguished American press, New Directions, hopefully early in 2022. So that's my good news. I'm going to read now a uh, excerpt from the excerpt from my novel in progress, The Tear Well, which appears in this marvelous anthology that Dane has put together and Guernica have published, and that represents the changing face of Canadian literature. This is out of the mouth of a six-year-old Jamaican girl. When I see Uncle Percy step to the veranda in big, long, thumping steps, that time my body come all over with shivers and chicken skin bumps. I can see from the crunch of his jaw and the shub out of his bottom lip that nothing good can come out of this visit with Papa. For I know how it look when a cock is fixing to fight a next cock. Uncle Percy hop up the tree steps and stand up square in front of Papa, like they are going to wrestle or, or play pack a cake. Papa is shorter than Uncle Percy, but he is thick, and now he lean out his solid chest like a bantam rooster. Uncle Percy pull up himself to his tallest tall and gaze down on Papa like a mighty Jesus from his throne on high. Uncle difference is he have a terrible look on his face. I don't think Jesus' face would ever sport a look like that. Uncle Percy make as if to say something, but Papa jump in first before any sound can finish making its way out of the O of Uncle Percy mouth. I had no alternative, Percy. The situation was deadly serious. The police were here. I, I did what I thought it best to do, and I immediately left messages for you and Max, as we agreed. You cannot possibly be annoyed. Uncle Percy don't say anything, just snarl rawr, rawr, and drag his lips back over his teeth like a bad dog when it getting ready to bite. I know Uncle Percy love Mama bad. Uncle Percy come first in Mama family. Uncle Max come next, then Mama at the end like me. And Mama is special because she is the one girl. Uncle Percy is tall and slender. He is strong and black as the ace of spades. I know about the ace of spades, which is the mightiest ace in the pack. Thank you, Pamela. Our next reading is an excerpt from Michael Mirola's Sixfold Reading Series, and this episode is with Leslie Shimotakahara, who will read an excerpt. Leslie Shimotakahara holds a PhD in English from Brown University. Her memoir, The Reading List, was winner of the Canada-Japan Literary Prize, and her fiction has been shortlisted for the K.M. Hunter Artist Award. 
She is the author of two novels, After the Bloom and Red Oblivion, published by Dundurn. I'll just say a bit about um, the flash fiction piece. It's called Masset Inlet 1922. Um, and it's a story that's inspired by the time when my grandmother lived in a small mill town on Masset Inlet on the Queen Charlotte Islands in the early 1920s. Her family had moved there from Prince Rupert, BC because her father had gotten a job working for Masset Timber Company which during World War I had greatly expanding lo expanded logging on the Charlottes. Right. This is because Sitka spruce trees, um, majestic in height and virtually bulletproof in durability, were needed for the Allies' aircrafts in Europe. Oh. But at the time of my short story in 1922, the war is now over and the logging camp is coming to the end of its boom years. I watch over this wild green place my father thinks he's the watchman, but where would he be if he didn't have me as his eyes? The good thing about being small is I can crouch low to the springy damp moss, as stealthy as a rabbit. Amidst these godly high trees, draped in glistening veils of lichens, I keep perfectly still while they exhale their cool breath all over my skin. I notice things, how the deer have gotten unnaturally big and bold, for instance. They breed like crazy, their offspring prancing around the raised areas of sun-bleached tree stumps, which look from a distance like whitened tombstones. Sadly, large sections of my lush fairyland have been reduced to such cemeteries, and men are discreetly packing up their families and gliding off in boats on the silvery water, a few more vanishing every day. Not just whites, but also Orientals, Chinese and Japanese alike. Soon me and my little sister may be the last Japanese girls around. Yet dad keeps his chin up. He seems to believe what the bosses tell him, that the boom can continue forever. I'm talking about the big American company that bought up this logging operation at the war's end. By then these majestic spruces were no longer needed to build the Allies' fighter planes over in Europe. When we first arrived, a giant raft of logs was bobbing forlornly by the dock no ship scheduled to come for it. One afternoon, I'm standing on Pebbly Beach, watching the cumulus clouds gently drift and gather weight when a bright flare ignites at the edge of my vision. A line of preternatural orange shoots across, traveling swiftly from the mill to the rooftops of bunkhouses. Fanned by the chilly breeze, the fire spreads eastward, and then men are tumbling out to the water's edge, buckets in hand. The women folk, my mother among them, aren't far behind, hauling furniture, setting it adrift on the waves, an attempt at salvage. Mm. Curtains of black smoke billow ghostly and slap at my cheeks, ashes raining down like singed cherry blossom petals. Mm. Arcs of frigid drops cut through the doleful cries. Some kids and women clamber up a ladder to get on a dock ship, but I just stand there motionless, incapable of moving. When all is over, when all is burnt to a crisp, I can see what's going to happen. The last of the stragglers will hightail it as fast as these nimble flames, but the watchman and his family won't go anywhere. I'll still be here, quietly keeping watch. Next up tonight, Pratap Reddy. Pratap Reddy moved to Canada in 2012. As an underwriter by day and a writer by night, he writes fiction about the agonies and the angst, on occasion the ecstasies, of new immigrants from India. He is an alumnus of the Humber School for Writers. He has received the Best Emerging Literary Artist Award from the Mississauga Arts Council. His work has been selected by Diaspora Dialogues for their mentorship programs. He is the author of two published books, Weather Permitting and Other Stories by Guernica Editions, published in 2016, and Ramya's Treasure, Guernica Editions, 2018. His new book, Remaindered People and Other Stories, is yet to be published. He lives in Mississauga with his wife and son. Welcome, Pratap. Hi, friends. After I immigrated to Canada and started writing, it was my impression that Candlet, unless it turned tone deaf, 
and colorblind, it would not recognize me as a writer. My looks, my accent, to say nothing of the content of my fiction, give me away. I am Pratap Reddy, author of Ramya's Treasure and a collection, Weather Permitting. A short story I wrote, The Lime Tree, appears in the anthology edited by Dane Swan. A remarkable anthology, you come across unexpected voices and unaccustomed viewpoints. My story is about a pair of unidentical twins, one living in Canada and the other in India. This story, while it makes no strident protestations about issues like racism and unequal participation, nevertheless, there is implied criticism, however mildly, about discrimination against girl child in India. And it also mentions in passing the society's sensitivity to color. Nevertheless, this story is an immigrant experience one and written by an immigrant. By its very nature, the very raison d'etre, it reflects the many barriers people of color must overcome. With this, I'd like to end this presentation, but I, before closing, I'd like to thank Gernika and Dane Swan for including me in this anthology. The anthology has such plain loads of talent, the glitterati, the literati, that I feel that I must throw away. However, until the flight marshal calls me out, I will enjoy the limelight. Thank you. Thank you, Pratap. Our next author is Senna Yi. Senna Yi is from Toronto, where she writes poetry, writes about films, and writes poetry about films. She is the author of the poetry nonfiction book, How Do I Look, with Metatron Press in 2017. She has a master's in cinema and media studies and focused her research on gendered robot design. Visit her website, www.senayi.com. Welcome, Senna. Hey everyone, I'm Senna Yi. Thanks so much for having me and thank you again to Dane for putting together this beautiful anthology. I'm so excited to be a part of it and super excited to read some pieces from it right now. So the first one is called Five Haiku Four Slash From Canada. Ask me where I'm from and I'll just say the same thing. Oh, Canada, duh. You're frightened that I flourished right in the hyphen that you slapped on me. We're more polite here. So polite we say nothing and smile about it. Us versus JT. Disappointed, not surprised. Sorry, not sorry. You tell me, go home. We both go our own way. You order Chinese. This next one is called Blade Runner 2049. I can be whatever you want me to be, except flesh and bone. Is a body not enough if it cannot touch or be touched? Can you love me without touching me? Can you touch me without loving me? Would you like me to tell you the truth or a lie? Here are some. You are special. I am special. You are free to go wherever you'd like. You are free to go. You are free. This one's called, But I'm a Cheerleader. We watch it every year in my high school's GSA. When Clea Duval reaches out and touches Natasha and Leon's arm in the dark, I watch you watch me pretending to watch the scene from the corners of my eyes. I am thinking of the back of your ears, the creases on the inside of your elbow, the hair on your knuckles. I am thinking of us apart together. 
And this last one is called Wanderlust. I have traveled halfway across the world to have white backpackers make me feel alien in the very continent that they insist I am really from. So those are my pieces in the anthology. Uh, check the rest out. Um, it's really awesome. Um, and some of my recent projects include uh, my very first children's book. It's called My Day with Gong Gong, and it's about a little girl and a visit with her grandpa in Chinatown, and that's available at Anik Press. Um, I've also recently launched a film recommendation generator app and a pop culture, pop culture journal with Gabrielle Marceau. It's called In the Mood Magazine. Uh, the app matches your mood up with a movie to watch, so if you're ever wondering what to watch while you're stuck at home, maybe you might enjoy it. Um, each of the recommendations uh, is written by different writers, artists, and filmmakers, and you can check that out at moodmoviematch.com. Thanks so much again for having me, and take care. So, Dane, you, you, you're, you're the editor of uh, Changing the Face of Canadian Literature the anthology that we pu we're publishing are, are you saying it, it, is that is there a bottleneck somewhere is there is there some place where uh th these authors that you're talking about that are out there that that uh, that uh, uh that uh you know deserve to be published is is there some place where they're being they're not there's a, what's the reason for their for them not being published well first i'd say that there are people getting published and there's even slowly but surely becoming more spaces where people can be published but we're not necessarily documenting that people are getting published that these diverse voices are getting published and if you don't recognize it then did it ever actually happen um you can always go change rewrite history if you don't document things as they're happening and so that's partially what i wanted to do and i also wanted to put a positive spin on things because often we um we look negatively on the struggle and we don't recognize what has been accomplished and yeah so that's pretty much where the title came from right yeah actually it reminds me a little bit of the argument that was taking place in the late 1970s when when italian canadian authors were were were, were were first, uh, you know, appearing, and 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 the argument then was, yeah, you, you can publish as many books as you like, and you can pub you can do all kinds of things, but but as 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 you said, if you if you don't have the the acknowledgement, it, it, they just end up in a, in, a, in a kind of a vacuum. The, the argument then was that uh, we needed the Italian Canadians at the time needed a critical analysis of, of, of the work. They needed people to, come to, to actually talk about the, the, what, what, what was being published uh, mm -hmm. and because it was being published. We needed people to talk about it. So in a sense then, in a sense you're saying that this is the kind of thing that should be taking place now with, you know, there are diverse writers out there and, and they are being published, but yeah. it, if they're not, if they don't get acknowledged, they don't. If we don't get uh, some sort of critical uh, analysis or critical uh, recognition for this, then then in some way or other, they're going to end up falling by the wayside or not. Well, not uh, yeah, to a certain <laughs> extent, because um, most of us learn about our literature through our school systems, and if there's not enough noise about certain groups of people being writers the teachers will never know so the teachers won't be able to seek out these people and um that's where it starts it starts with recognizing w when you're a kid in your school and someone says here's this person who looks similar to you or has a similar background as your parents and by the way they're a writer and that could have a huge impact on your life and so that's part of it i think Thank you, Dane and Michael. Our next author is Charles C. Smith. Charles C. Smith has written and edited 14 books. He studied poetry with William Picard at New York University 
edited three collections of poetry, and his poetry has appeared in numerous journals and magazines, including Poetry Canada Review, The Quill and Choir, Descant, Dandelion, and The Fiddlehead. His recent books include Travelogue of the Bereaved, Whispers, and Destination Out. Welcome, Charles. Good day, whatever time it is for you. It's about noonish for me here in Toronto. And I'm really honored to be um, reading some poems from this book, magnificent book put together by Dane Swan called The Changing Face of Canadian Literature out through Guernica Editions. I'm going to read two poems. Uh, the first one is uh, for Julia Seisman, and the second one is much more personal in terms of my journeys to the place where I've lived for many years to where I am now. So the first one for Julius Eastman, this is the character of the storyteller in what is a long poem um, for Julius. With what there is to know and all that fits like stones within memory, once known, forgotten as if a dream, not wanting to be told, censored and grieving, remembered now as flames, reborn and roaming, the borders of New York, Ithaca, Buffalo, Vienna, ballet classes, piano stools, concert halls decked in black, the gay underground, village of subway washrooms, 10 a.m. whiskey in a trench coat, rehearsals in black leather and jeans on the Lower East Side. You're a buffalo house, a white space open to many. You drop things when there, clothes and lovers, the homeless man you invited in who took you for a ride. Those unpredictable notes in your later improvised compositions, evil nigger, stay on it, prelude to St. Joan, gay gorilla. That deep baritone, mad as a king, a supplicant saint, defiant in a sinister, all-consuming rage, fingers plowing pianos and cellos groaning the weight of spirit memories. An anomaly. The music stuck to your skin, would not let you be, and carried you into oblivion, away from Singletary and the Brooklyn Philharmonia, who matched your notes with some sense of belonging, quivering in a form that would not offer itself, nor set aside provenance in a common hue to any who could easily be seen, and what that fueled you to do, once the forbidden tomes of sex and skin let you loose like a knife, sharpened on the edge of disdain, your complete and utter deliverance into what you did, and how, and with whom, and the terms you set for sharing, with only a few following, out of love, sex, disbelief, angling like small children held close then left astray. But were you ever open enough to let anything else in? Such lightning and stories, your music and imagination, your strange and sudden arrivals, departures at the loading bait gate of the ephemeral, the branding of a label you would live to regret. So instead of a sinecure, you sought out the sin to cure with little regard for anything, especially yourself. In those years you went missing with none aware of your passing until eight months after, a small capture in the village voice reminding those who abandoned you of your time and telling the blistering hypnotic succulence, your voice and notes, dance and ten cellos, eight hands on four grand pianos. It is this telling your dark hangouts and hoods, the tumble, turning, falling alone, a wanderer wounded, cloistered into timelessness, a sodden mystery like no other, with so many before without sequence, and several coming after. You found the branch, it cracked through your telling, and you fell, black Icarus, without angel wings, in America. Julius Eastman was a rather iconoclastic black queer composer, musician, singer, choreographer, pianist in the 1960s and 80s, active in creating music in mostly in Buffalo, New York, and the downtown Manhattan um, minimalist music scene. This next poem I'm going to read is called Going Home. The long, narrow island falls away behind thick green water, 
Seagulls blanket the sky and circle a drab orange ferry that moves like an ocelot slowly disengaging. Out of the creaking wooden dock it slides into the open where the seething Atlantic eats the littered Hudson, churned into mist by the old boat's propellers. Small cargo tugs and rusting ocean freighters lug huge loads like snails and turtles east and west, thick gray smoke inching from their black stacks. I have made this journey often and watched the place where I grew fade into distance, saw again and again the thin white church spire, small offices of government and business give way to buses climbing out of their stalls like ants, commuter trains, steel wheels, screeching sparks, then receding quicker than the memory of an Alzheimer patient dwindling behind yellow walls of a sanatorium. The crew, calm as can be expected, they share cigarettes, coffee, curses, bets on these seemingly endless trips they make. While well, I am on another excursion to LaGuardia Airport for a short flight home, what I have done so many times over 26 years, several planes now fogged in the military security, I lounge in departures for hours listening to CNN's urgent news, some imminent threat, a Trump Tweet replacing an O'Brien on every TV screen, rebutting truths as if they were attack ads, complaining about what everyone else has. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Next up, we have author Michael Frazier. Michael Frazier has been published in numerous national and international anthologies and journals, including Paris Atlantic, Arc Poetry Magazine, CV2, and The Caribbean Writer. He was published in the Best Canadian Poetry in English 2013. He won Free Falls 2014 and 2015 Poetry Contest. He won the 2016 CBC Poetry Prize. His latest book is To Greet Yourself Arriving, published by Tightrope Books in 2016. Welcome, Michael. Hey everyone, Michael Fraser here. I am thrilled to be part of this launch for changing the face of Canadian literature. And I'm even more thrilled to um, be one of the writers in here. And many thanks to Dane Swan for including me. And it's just wonderful to be surrounded by the works of so many excellent writers. I'm going to read one poem from the anthology. And the poem is entitled Grand Junction. And it's part of a suite of poems I've been writing now for quite a while about the Canadian contribution to the American Civil War. Grand Junction. I became contraband, near about muled back to bondage, when a copperhead and his consort led me night in their hayloft, till I heard him wish General Lee had triumphed in Antietam and closed the ball early. I had to acknowledge the corn before he grabbed his pig sticker. I fleet-footed for miles through torn Tennessee, hitched with fellow runners plowing north on hold wagon roads. We reached Union lines where pickets led us under spry moongleam. We wolfed down liver mush sided with collared baits before sips of old red-eye laid us log still. Morning splashed the Jonah's den we had happened into. Scores of fellow Negroes lay strewn with heads balanced on haversacks. Some grayback infected, dew poisoned along pip jennies, slumped with shakes on litters. The strong rooted up for colored regiments. They were tenderfoot fresh fish fitted in northern wool navy sack coats cupping lead pillboxes and shooting irons. There were top reel sawbones employing keen mother wit in the field hospital. Near mustered out yanks arrived like fallen timber prone on pushcarts. Others shanks mirror. It was butcher's fear. Sawbones wallpapered the wounded with pop skull whiskey before severing limbs clean through joints. The sliced screams air cracking sharp like chain lightning, crisping, peeled flesh. Thank you, Michael. Our next reading 
is by Danila Bofa, and this is an excerpt from the sixfold interview with Michael Mirola. Danila Botha is the author of two short story collections, Got No Secrets and For All the Men and Some of the Women I've Known, which was a finalist for the Trillium Book Award, the Vine Awards, and the Relit Award. She's also the author of the novel Too Much on the Inside, which won a Book Excellence Award and was shortlisted for a Relit Award. Danila teaches creative writing at University of Toronto and Humber School for Writers. Welcome, Danila. It was another two and a half months before Hannah saw her again. Jillian had become something of a punchline to Cassidy whenever they went back to the pub. Remember the time you kissed a girl and you liked it? She joked sing and Hannah would laugh and roll her eyes, her heart thudding in her ears. She dropped the story into conversations with other friends casually just to see how they'd react. If they knew who Jillian was, they didn't know anything about her. That girl is a walking breathe thirst trap, someone said. And Hannah wondered why she saw her so differently. To her, Jillian seemed mythical and kind of magical. There was, some, there was nothing noteworthy about any of these other people. She went back to the pub alone at least once a week, always wearing cute eyeliner and homemade jewelry. And a couple of times she even went to an open mic, her face glued to her phone screen, looking up casually in case she could catch her eye, but she never saw Jillian. At least no one ever saw her there trying so hard. She finally saw her again in an elective class that she almost didn't take. A class that technically fit into her schedule, but seemed ridiculous. Somehow Hannah, a newly, seri a newly serious commerce major, had found herself in an introduction to creative writing. To get in, she had to write a short story, which she'd done on the endless bus ride to her mother's house. She wrote about her childhood in BC, the hippie collective her parents had started called The Tribe, the hybrid of languages and religious practices that governed their lives, her dad's role as the father, it wasn't fiction, technically, but she knew that no one in their right mind would ever believe it had really happened. Apparently, the story was good enough to get her into the course. The professor who had wild, dark red streaked curls and was wearing red fishnet gloves under her black suit jacket made a joke about T.S. Eliot looking out the window, thinking what a hole the landscape was. Imagine what he would have thought of this campus, she added. Hannah loved her instantly. Now write about your idea of the wasteland, she said, after they'd finished the first three verses out loud. Hannah stared at her laptop screen. She thought of the building they were in, a beige high rise that looked like 25 stories of cinder blocks. They weren't far from townhouses, kiddie pools, and small manicured bits of lawn. She was supposed to feel oppressed by all of that, she knew. That was what normal people felt, boredom and ennui. But the suburbs have always felt comfortingly bland, full of people whose biggest problem was a lack of stimulation, people who believed her when she acted like she'd always lived in a place like this. The suburbs were a haven, a hive of inactivity where everyone lived in subdivisions that were comfortingly all the same. Everyone had a routine, school, soccer, after school jobs, who always knew what to expect. My mom went from being a nurturer to an actual nurse. She got legally married for the for the first time, changed our last name. Finally, she wanted to protect me. We're not hiding from your father, we're being our true self, she said. And we decorated our new house in white, the color of walls was called Angel's Kiss. The suburbs are the place where I actually went to real school, where I had friends and went on dates and worried about stupid things like homework. And my stepdad gave me a hard time about coming home late. And it all felt like a fever dream until I fucked it all up and then I woke up. And I felt the bile rising in her chest when she looked at the words. She put her hand down hard on her backspace key and deleted them all. When the professor asked for a volunteer, she heard the jangling of bracelets as a hand shot up in the back of the classroom. She recognized Jillian's raspy voice instantly and she turned around to look at her. Jillian was wearing an, or an olive crinkly dress, her black hair piled into a messy top knot. December is the cruelest month, she read, her lips flashing what looked like a mix of red lipstick and big chunks of red glitter. Breeding, flashing neon anger towards Christmas, the claustrophobia of strip malls, the nasal drone of Alban and the chipmunks singing the hula hoop song or jingle bells, the silver tinsel hanging in narrow doorways, reminders that we are not Christian or Canadian. Only in the summer do I feel human. The professor laughed dryly. That, she said slowly, was a great example of using everything you have to create something surprisingly beautiful. As soon as the class ended, Hannah got up and inched over to where Jillian was standing. 
A group of students have gathered around her, including Amelia, a girl who loudly told everyone that she'd been accepted into a prestigious creative writing program in the States in the middle of a cornfield somewhere, she said, and that she'd recently been published in a literary journal. Hannah hadn't known that writers could be as competitive as the people in her business program. She was relieved that this was just a random elective. In the bright daytime light, Jillian's skin was the color of milky tea. Her eyeliner was smeared under her eyes. Her purse was made of denim and was covered in silver studs and band buttons. Hannah only recognized PJ Harvey. Your poem was so original, Hannah blurted out. I loved it. Amelia snorted. She leaned forward and her long metal necklaces clanged against each other. Have you ever read The Wasteland? Not yet. I've never taken a class like this before. I just read what we had to read for today. You might want to try reading more, Amelia added. Or maybe, she added, looking Hannah up and down, it's just not your thing. Maybe you'd be better at something like copywriting. Hannah wanted to laugh. She wanted to say that she, she had to choose between being a copywriter and being a poet. Being a copywriter was better. They at least got paid to write for a living. She looked over at Jillian, who was curiously quiet. A strip of red crept across the pale skin on her neck. She turned away and walked outside, instead fumbling with her bright green lighter. She tried not to smoke as often anymore, but it was hard to give up absolutely everything. Here, I have another one, Jillian said, coming up behind her. I love your hair, by the way. Hannah smirked. It was a lot more purple before. It's kind of old ladyish now, which is probably the perfect basic shade for working the front desk at an ad agency. I'm sure that's where I'll be going when I graduate, you know, or a Starbucks making pumpkin spice lattes. Jillian let out a deep, full-bodied laugh. No, you look great, Jillian insisted. I love lavender. It was a different color before, wasn't it? Hannah pushed her hair away from her face and looked at Jillian. Really flooded her. Yeah, a few months ago it was green. First forest and then mint. I didn't think you'd remember me. Next up, Lisa Dean. Lisa Dean is a graduate of the University of Guelph's MFA program and a creative writing instructor at Selkirk College in the Kootenay region of British Columbia. Her first book, Waiting for the Cyclone, was shortlisted for the 2017 Trillium and Relit Awards. Welcome, Lisa. Hi, everyone. This is Lisa Dean. I'm reporting to you from Cristova, British Columbia, where I live. Um, I'm really pleased to be part of this online launch and obviously just having my work included in this anthology has been the most amazing thing ever. So thanks to everyone who contributed and of course thanks to Guernica and Dane for having um, the great idea to bring this into being. I'm going to read a little excerpt from my essay, it's called When Saturn Returns, and it was about um, when my Saturn return happened in my late 20s, early 30s, and my mother's happened in her 60s and she died. So this is a small excerpt of the day that I found out that my mother had passed away. Saturn was still lingering at age 30, but I was getting comfortable in my new orbit. I moved to Toronto for grad school, a city I'd scorned as a Montrealer but soon came to love. My friends were all in the arts, and I didn't have to worry about whether to approach strangers in English or in French. I dispatched highlights to my mother via telephone, master classes with famous writers, my feminist roommates, a sudden ability to speak up in class without feeling anxious. But my relationship with alcohol was changing. I started drinking more to cope with the stress of grad school, and I couldn't seem to navigate the line between getting home safe and blacking out. Sometimes I woke up and I didn't know where I was. In exchange, mom confided that a bone infection had been ravaging my father's body since Christmas. There was talk of amputation, but mom was hopeful that these new IV drugs would work. She asked me not to tell anyone. In my nonfiction workshop, I started writing about mom. Only four foot 11 with wrists like skinny twigs, she worked as a nurse for 20 years until lifting heavy patients eroded her health. It wasn't just her small size and the eventual carpal tunnel, though. It was polio, the metal rod in her spine that allowed her to walk upright, mostly. There were bones missing from various parts of her body, and she wore pants to hide the scars. I didn't know these things until I was a teenager, only because my grandmother told me in secret. I wanted other people to know what my mother's life had been like. Mom was about to turn 60, which meant she was entering her second Saturn return. During the first one, she had a miscarriage. I wondered what might happen this time. Mum deflected questions about her nine months in a body cast by talking about summers on a farm in Alberta and her mean alcoholic grandfather. 
She described how at 18, she picked up my dad hitchhiking. Not love at first sight, but more of an awareness that they would eventually end up together. We began to talk that day and every day, closing that gap between mother and daughter. Eventually, she did tell me about the body cast. I listened, but I didn't end up writing about it. That was her secret to keep. Her birthday was coming in three weeks, and finally she'd be getting a pension check. I'm going traveling, she exclaimed. I think she meant without my father. The day of my nonfiction workshop, I felt like a child at show and tell, holding up my most treasured possession, my mother. People sensed her voice in the essay. They admired her determination to be a nurse despite her disability. I left the room at break, just glowing with familiar pride. I came from a strong matriarch and it had been validated by an outside audience. That night, I had a date with a light-haired, blue-eyed writer who had become the target of my misguided love based on an astrology chart reading I'd received years before. I pulled out my phone to see if he had messaged me. He hadn't, but I missed calls from home, too many. I thought of my father, the IV, his foot, and thought, oh God, but it wasn't dad, it was mom. Thanks for listening and thanks again to everyone. Our final reader tonight, Danielle Donorio. Danielle Donorio is a writer and performer of poetry, songs, plays, and prose. Born in a hospital atop a mountain edge in Veroli, a small city in south central Italy, he grew up in Canada and lives in Brampton, Ontario. His writing evades the genre and leaves a few subjects untouched. Welcome, Danielle. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are at whatever time you see this. Uh, my name is Daniele Donorio, and I am uh, honored to be a part of changing the face of Canadian literature under Guernica Editions. Uh, I want to start by thanking Michael for lighting the path to a project like this. Uh, to Dane Swan for putting brickwork and vision into every single piece that appears in this book and to being able to take that inspiration and that idea and bring it to manifest. Also uh, thank you to Margot Lapierre for her patience with this video. Um, I won't read uh, the selection uh, that I was fortunate enough to author uh, as a channel, as I believe um, all of the things that I am fortunate enough to write are um, coming through me. But I will say a little bit about how it came to me. So uh, Italian internment was always something uh, in the back of my mind that I wondered why more people didn't know about, uh, especially Canadians. It seemed most of the information about it came from outside sources, outside of Canada, but it always surprised me that it wasn't more well known, but also didn't surprise me based on how things are often written in history. So the contact I had with the Italian internment, of course, inspired uh, this piece that came through me, uh, titled No Camp for the Soul. Um, but also a couple of experiences and some other events in my life. One being uh, becoming a Canadian citizen in 2006, uh, where I had to stand before the oath of citizenship, which uh, I won't comment on whether or not I recited at the citizenship hearing, but uh, it stood out to me very drastically uh, what I was being asked to say, what I was being asked to pledge. And so ideas began to come. And then also in the years 1939 and 1947, uh, a 
series of letters were written to Queen Elizabeth and King George of England the seventh by a very powerful uh, spiritual leader who was warning uh, more informing more sharing uh, some ideas on our true identity and those letters uh, my experience with the oath and my knowledge of Italian internment in Canada is what came together to birth this writing, No Camp for the Soul. Um, so I, I chose not to read from the book, but um, I did want to share just a, a small exercise with you on uh, an experience that I had, a spiritual experience that led to sort of this, this writing, but also many other things creatively for me in my life. Um, I want you to place three items in front of you. And uh, I'll give you a moment to round up these items. Um, so just place three items that you have. They could just be from around where you are, uh, close to you on a, on a coffee table or something, and just place them in front of you and uh, just take a look at them for a, a moment and pick one up. And I just want you to identify the object and then its owner. So maybe it's a cell phone, maybe it's a, uh, a notebook, maybe it's a wallet, maybe it's a watch, uh, whatever it is. I want you to just pick up one item, identify it, and then identify its owner. And do that for each item. I'll give you a moment. It doesn't have to be you know, a, a ritual of sorts, but just picking up the item, identifying what it is, and identifying its owner. After you've done that, um, with the same hand that you've picked these items up and identified their owner, I want you to hold it up and identify it. And it's a hand. Then identify its owner. You. And you come to a sort of a point where this is your hand. So then you can't be your hand. So then who does this leave you being? A being. And just churning that experience and taking that into thought and reflection uh, allowed me to have certain experiences in my life that uh, led to the opening of that gate where this work uh, could come to to fruition and to manifest the way that it did. So yeah, that's no camp for the soul. I invite you to to let that marinate, let that churn in your mind, and spend some time with it. So spend some time if you know if you have the time, uh, which it seems we do more now than than we have for a while. And I, I believe this time is being given to us for a reason. So. I believe we all have the capability to make the most of it, whatever location, situation may be. But, uh, so yeah, take a moment and, uh, and then when you can, pick up the changing of the face of Canadian literature right here in front of you. Pick this up, um, enjoy the writing in it, um, take it in and, and allow uh, sort of allow the voice of Canadian literature to be reborn in your consciousness through what you're reading and and who you are who you are reading whose voice you are hearing uh, and make note of whose voice you're hearing for each of the pieces that are in this book um, it's a great piece of, of work and a great anthology that uh, again I, I thank Dane Swan for putting together and, and Michael for lighting the path to have it come come to us in this form and enjoy it enjoy the, the writing and, and allow it to touch you, touch your heart and go back to who are you who are we thank you
Thank you, Danielle.